Hi, welcome to Mr. Dyer's Musings. I'm Mr. Dyer, and today we're going to talk about Boy Scout Hackersacks. As always, I'd like to thank my wife and family for their unconditional support. I'd like to thank my students for our helping me to be a better teacher, always pushing me to be better, learning new things, reading ravenously as much material as I can, uh, trying to pick out different details that I can add to my class and to help them get hooked on our history, especially American history. Thank you to my subscribers. Thank you to you for watching this, taking the time out of your day uh, and giving this a shot. If you're new to my channel, if you like this stuff, if you like history, if you like me showing you artifacts and explaining things, please consider checking out my other videos and subscribing. And please share, you know, help this channel grow, uh, help others learn, and who knows what might get you interested. Okay, so if you are a regular viewer of my channel and my videos, you know that I've pretty much focused on Civil War, especially Civil War medicine. And I've put Civil War on the back burner for right now. Uh, I have, have plenty more to talk about, but I got a little, I got bitten by a bug and I, I didn't get to do much camping this summer. I didn't, I'm a scout leader. I didn't even get to go out with my troop or my pack. And summer for me is a time to get outside, go hiking, go camping. And I'm a pack leader of my son's pack and my, my local troop. So without having Civil War reenacting to fall upon to kind of satisfy me. I've been looking elsewhere, you know? Um, so I bit onto this idea of doing a Boy Scout impression for my sons and a Boy Scout leader impression for me so we can go to early 20th century living histories and reenactments, especially World War II events. Here in Ohio, up in Conneaut, if you've never been or if you've, you should check out the videos and stuff, they do a huge reenactment on D-Day. So that's pretty much in my backyard. It's about three hours away from where I live, but it's still a lot closer than many other events, especially on Civil War national events. I'd have to travel much farther than that. So th I think this is a good opportunity for me to learn some new material, right? Especially new material culture, see the relationship between the Boy Scouts, which is something that I love, and that military culture of the early 20th century, patriotism, etc., and teach these things to my boys, you know, my boys getting them in uniform, uh, they're excited. Like every time that I get something in the mail right now, they are really curious, they get really happy and they ask about it. So they're learning about it, you know, and it's getting them interested in history as well, which as a teacher, like that's my goal. If I can get a, a student, a kid interested in some aspect of history, that's a golden day for me, you know, test, no test, whatever. If they're interested in a historical subject, I feel like I've done my job, okay? So anyhow, today's video is about the haversack. Now, if you're a Civil War reenactor, a haversack is, generally speaking, that's your kitchen. Uh, Civil War Digital Digest does a really good video on Civil War haversacks, and I'll post their link above here so you can check them out. Um, the 11th Ohio Volunteer Cavalry even does a discussion about how the cavalry uses utilize the haversack. And I'll try to post a video up here if I can find it. But nothing else. Go check out those two channels for Civil War information. They're really good. Not as good as me, of course. I'm just kidding with you. So they're pretty good. Um, so if you're interested in Civil War haversacks or you know about Civil War haversacks, you know that that's pretty much the soldier's kitchen. That's where you would keep your plate, maybe, your Civil War, maybe. But generally speaking, that's where you want to keep all your food, Okay. Um, and the several days rations, that takes up a lot of space. Well, the Boy Scouts utilize the haversack idea in kind of a different way. And you got to think about the stature of a 12-year-old boy. In the 1910, that's when the Boy Scouts of America was founded. Um, I'm focusing on the 1920s to the 1930s. But some of that stuff kind of transitions. You know, there's this period where things are utilized and things fade out. Okay. The haversacks that the Boy Scouts used was patterned off of the M1898 Spanish-American War haversack. 
And when you look at an original Spanish American War haversack and you look at a Boy Scout haversack and you sit them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable, except for where the straps are. The straps are the key. Generally speaking, the haversack is worn over the shoulder and down to the side. Okay, if you can make get that motion over your shoulder down to your side. And it kind of hangs down at the hip, on the back hip. Now, at the time of World War I, when that came around, they actually started adding um, clips to the Spanish-American War haversack, or the M1898 haversack, so that it could be worn on the belt, because they created the uh, military belt, the rigging, which is pretty close to what our current military use, the military used in the early 2000s. Um, so it's set up for that with little eyelets and you just hook it in. Well, the Boy Scouts, especially as boys going on a weekend camp out or whatever, you don't need a ton of space. So they took the Spanish American War haversack, they put their stamp on it, and they're going to adjust the rigging. I have two examples of that haversack, two, which is really cool because they're kind of hard to find. Um, I found one other one that I was tempted to get on eBay, but it was so torn up that it just, I didn't think it was really worth the money because I'm trying to buy this original equipment so that my sons can utilize it. So I do have some examples. They both need a little bit of work, but they don't have gaping holes in them. Now the first one I'm going to show you is this one. As you can see here, it has little eyelets. It has the Boy Scout logo. It says um, headquarters, New York. And that's how you know it was made before the 1950s. If you're dating stuff, if you open up the top flap here, now you're going to see a line there and a line there. And you have this space. This space was meant to use the, um, what they call the meat can or the mess tin that World War I soldiers and a little bit before used. And it's shaped like an oval. So it would just slide right in there. And then you have these two pockets here for your silverware. Now the silverware in the military was issued in leather cases for the knife and the fork and the spoon. They didn't need it. So that's why this is shaped and cut out like it is. Because many Boy Scouts, especially in 1910 when the um, movement first started here in the United States, Boy Scouts were literally using military surplus items. So it just kind of made sense for national supply to use that to their advantage. Kids already got this equipment. Their dads were already in, served in World War I. Maybe the Spanish-American War. They may have some of this stuff sitting around. So why not, right? It just makes sense. And then you have this open part here, and that's where you'd put your clothes or your other goods. And it has a buckle. In here, it does have a little button, so you can see, so you can close that up. And when you flap this open, your pan doesn't fall out everywhere. Okay, so that's the front. Well, or I guess the inside flaps. And now we have this section. This is the rigging. Now this is really where the other haversack I have is very different. And I try to look up old equipment catalogs, etc. to see why that difference is. But I, I, I'm still working on it. So I'll, I'll update you. If you're a fan of Mr. Dyer's Museum's Facebook page, I post a lot of my research on there. So if you get a chance, go over there, like it, subscribe, so you can get updated with all the stuff that I find. So I'm not going to make a special video. I might mention another video if I find some information just to kind of update you. But otherwise, that's the best way to get updates. So it has this little strap here, and it has a little D-ring. Now, the M1898s had a strap here and a strap here. And there's a remnant where you can see that there was something possibly stitched here and especially here. 
Yeah, you can see like a dark outline, etc. So maybe it got ripped out, maybe the scout took it out or something, I don't know. But anyhow, you can still use this as a back. And on the bottom here, you would have a D-ring and this one's torn out right there. So I need to make a new one and uh, stitch it on there, a replacement, a field repair, if you will. But those D-rings would be at the bottom. And that's how you would rig out and use it. Now the Boy Scouts of America in their catalog say that this is like the perfect size for your overnight camping or a day bag, etc. And they sold a rover bag. In my last video, speaking of updates, I showed a couple other of the um, knapsacks, or yeah, knapsacks. It's kind of like the Yucca style before Yucca started supplying stuff for the Boy Scouts. It's called the Rover Bag, a Rover Pack. And I had a question, it's like, well, where did this Rover, I've never seen an example of the Rover Pack. I did eBay searches and Google searches and I couldn't find a picture of an original. But then I found a catalog from I think the 30s and it shows the Rover Pack. And the Rover Pack was pretty much just a duffel bag. So it had a cinch top, it was a duffel bag that you could wear on your back. It was a small size for a Boy Scout. And they made even uh, larger ones that you would just carry, especially for like the jamboree issue. They were trying to push that. So there you have it. That is this example of the, um, the Haversack, the Boy Scout Haversack. The other example that I have, and I have this one packed with some of my son's Boy Scout clothing, but as you can see, pretty much looks exactly the same. It has the same pocket, center pocket for that meat can, has the two pockets for the fork. As you can see, this is ripped out, I have to repair it. And this is where the strap would have been stitched for the buckle. So right now, this just kind of flaps. I don't have a buckle to, to push it down. Um, yeah, so let's look at the back. Okay, so this is the back. It has the two D-rings that I've mentioned on the other one. It has the middle ring, but this middle ring is much lower, much lower than this one. This one's like towards the top. This one's towards the middle. So I kind of wonder if maybe um, an adjustment was made or something that maybe it didn't have the D-rings. Maybe this was just good enough. And I'll show you a picture in the catalog of this because uh, the middle D-ring is important because that's where things buckle. This one, as you can see, it's rigged through the eyelet. And this is really comfortable to carry because you don't have these brass pieces um, really digging into your shoulder bones. Instead, it's in the hollow of your back. I think that's pretty ingenious. And I have to give my wife credit because when I got this thing, it was snapped to these D-rings. I was like, oh, how does this work? And I, I snapped it down here at first without snapping those, thinking that maybe equipment was strapped to the top. So I went ahead and stuffed it with clothes like it currently is just to see, well, how comfortable would it be to have something on top like a bed roll and you just use this D-ring? It wasn't very comfortable. It was very off kilter. Um, it was horrible. But then my wife said, here, let me, let me show you. Let me show you. And she did it. And I was like, ah, brilliant. That's why she's the engineer, not me. Um, <laughs> so anyhow, that's how I suspect this is rigged. If you're an old timer, maybe you saw your grandpa or dad's equipment and you saw one of this model and they showed you, please, you know, share with me. Either in Sherman or say, Sean, you're doing it wrong. Okay, so now you have your D-rings down here. There is a picture of scouts using the knapsack. So the knapsack was promoted pretty well. It was much more affordable than the other bags. Um, and this was kind of considered the essential pack for your average everyday scout. And in the picture, they show the bedroll being lashed to the bottom here. So it's carried on the bottom instead of the top. Um, another example of being used is lashing the, the bedroll 
in like a horseshoe and you would put your bedroll on the side, lay it down, wrap it around, put that over top of it to help hold it. And then maybe you take a piece of rope or something and lash it around the sides and keep it good and tight. And I, when I get my stuff, and I will show you various ways of how to pack this pack according to different pictures and things and what might go in that pack. Okay, so here's my thought when I did this. When I had this all filled out and I put it on my back and everything and I'm carrying it on my back, I'm like, you know what? This is a lot like something else I've used in the past. What do you think it is? It's very, very similar to this bad boy here. This is the 1858 double bag knapsack. Okay, here is where you keep like all your personal items, like uh, extra clothing, um, your toiletries, etc. Down here is where you would put your uh, blanket, your shelter half, um, maybe some rope, etc. Again, Civil War Digital Digest did a great video on that as well. So I don't really need to do that. They did a good job. Um, so anyhow, the haversack that I just showed you is a lot like the double bag knapsack. And I was a reenactor for years. Authentic Campaigner is a really good source for people who have done experimental archeology, span etc. And if you are a Civil War reenactor, you generally speaking put your blanket, but it's not supposed to be for your blanket. It's actually supposed to be for your great coat. These are great coat straps. But you may have taken your straps, your arm straps, and looped it through your great coat straps like so. And what that does is that puts this lower on your back and makes it a little bit more comfortable to wear. That is this system here effectively. That's exactly what this system is. This is kind of where your coat, your uh, great coat straps would be. Um, and it holds it nice and tight, brings it into your shoulders, etc. And it's pretty comfortable. It's centered in the hollow of your back, which is the most comfortable place to carry this type of bag. There you go. That is the Boy Scout Haversack. One more feature that I guess I didn't mention. I should because you can use this like a haversack. It has the clips down here on both and it has these clips right here. So all you have to do is just take this clip, take it out of these smaller D-rings, bear with me. It was a lot easier getting them in than what I assume it will be getting them out. So you can take your clip, like so, clip it there, unclip the bottom, now we're unclipping the other side. So if you're, you know, I don't know, going on a pretty short hike and you don't have a lot of weight to bear. This is a really good way of carrying your bag. And you just take the two clips, join them like so, and you have your man purse, also known as the haversack. There you go. And it has these adjustable pieces here, so you can make it lower or higher on your shoulder or whatever. And there you have it. That's everything you need for your pretty much your weekend camp out um, if you're a Boy Scout in the 1920s and 1930s. This started fading out in the, 19, the late like 1930s, and they were kind of going more to the yucca um, style pack. I, I have one order. 
a late 30s haversack. It's a little bit different than these two. Um, when I get it in, uh, I'm sure I'll make another video. I, I've got some canteens and um, belts and uniforms, etc. Like, I've been buying up stuff, and it's actually pretty, pretty affordable. I hope I'm not you know, shooting myself in the foot on this. But if you're looking to do Boy Scout living history, now's the time to do it, really, because you can get original equipment, and it's fairly affordable. A lot of Boy Scout collectors are more into the patches and stuff, not so much the equipment, which surprises me because the equipment is stuff that you can use on a regular basis. Not so much the the patches, but you know, each to their own. Patches take up a lot less space, I guess. <laughs> so if you have any questions, please post them and I'll try to answer them. This area of history is not something that I'm as knowledgeable about, I'm going through a learning process of it. If you have something to share, first-hand account of you as a scout or your grandfather, your dad, or whatever, using this type of equipment, please post it. Um, I'm learning. I'm, I'm doing this so I can share what I learn. And if you share with the rest of us what you know, that goes a long way. So thank you so much for joining me. It's uh, 20 minutes. I, I made a promise. A long time ago that I was going to try to keep these at like 15. But it's kind of hard to do when I get on a roll. My students can attest to that. So anyhow, I hope it was informative. I hope you liked it. I hope you found it interesting. Maybe it uh, intrigued you enough to dig a little bit more into Spanish-American War history or World War I history. There's some really good articles about the haversack and how it was utilized. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful day. It was during the day and you're watching this. Uh, enjoy your week. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones and take care. Oh, I forgot. Please like and subscribe if you haven't done so. Now have a wonderful night. Give a kiss and hug to your loved ones and take care.